so happy to be here with you this morning to celebrate the Lord Jesus, to lift our hearts up to Him, and especially delighted that uh, we have a baptism uh, this morning, and we're glad that Charlie is with us too. Yeah. So we're especially delighted today. Are you prepared to worship God? Yes. yes. Well, then I invite you to stand and join with me, and to God be the glory.
before we proceed with the actual baptism itself, I'm going to say a few words about baptism and the theology of baptism. Now, some people think theology is a bad word, but I'm not one of those people. So we're going to uh, parse this out a little bit, not, not a real one. This is not a sermon. I got that later. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the, the main thing to remember about there are two sacraments that most Reformed congregations hang on to. Okay, the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And the two words that you want to remember when we talk about the sacraments is, are the words a sign and a seal. Okay, a sign and a seal. Now, the idea of a sign is, is pretty well familiar to us, right? A lot of us have been traveling, and so, you know, we look at the road signs, right? We went down 81 this past, uh, past week for Thanksgiving, you know, and we have to get off when the sign says to get off on a certain road. Uh, we don't want to make a U-turn in the middle of the road when it says no U-turn, so the signs kind of direct and tell us what to do. A sign is um, not the same thing as the substance itself, but in the case of a sacrament, it is very close to the substance of what it points to. And what the sign points to, in this case, in the case of baptism, is the inclusion of people into God's covenant of grace. Now, those who are regular attenders here at Oxford, that should ring a bell with them. And the reason is because for the last six weeks or more, we have been studying and tracing God's covenant grace for people down from the time of Abraham, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And that covenant comes down to us in the New Testament through our Lord and Savior Jesus. So this, this sacrament of baptism is the inclusion into that covenant of grace with our Savior Jesus. That's what we're saying here today. Now the idea of something being a seal is not as immediately apparent today as it would have been when those words, um, you know, especially the seal, had a slightly different meaning, okay? The idea of a seal is that it is actually attached to a trustworthy document to certify that this is the real thing. Now, the thing that we have today that is more like the old understanding of seals is, have you ever gotten a paper with it, a deed or something like that, that was signed by a notary public, that attestation of the notary public says, yes, this is the real thing. This is your deed, this is your, I don't know, all kinds of things that notary publics attest to. And these sacraments attest to the reality of God's grace in that covenant of grace. Now, in the olden days, instead of having the notary public write it out like that, what they would have done, and some of you, um, uh, I'm not casting aspersions now, but some of you might be old enough to remember this, that they used to put a wax seal on documents or letters or things like that to prove, oh, this came from a certain person or this means a certain thing, and they would put their stamp in that wax. That's what we're saying here today, is that baptism and communion are the seal that God puts on these activities to show this is the real thing. This is not just something that we made up along the way. So a sign and a seal of God's covenant of grace. Now we're happy to have um, not only uh, Dan and Sarah here today and Charlie, but we've got family members and I'm going to invite you folks.
folks to come up who are going to participate in the baptism. I'm going to come down from the pulpit. And if you'll come up and join me at the front here, see, I'm going to move this over a little bit. Back of your bulletin, you might want to have that ready here. On the back of your bulletin are the questions that we're going to ask the parents in just a moment or two, and also the questions for you as the congregation. You have a very important part to play in this sacrament of baptism of an infant. Um, Jesus himself said to let the little children come to him and do not hinder them, do not forbid them to come. So, Charlie, you come at the invitation of Jesus this morning. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. Now, the, uh, the couple has already, uh, Dan and Sarah have already appeared before the session. Okay? And they have uh, indicated their intention to offer their child, uh, Charlie, for baptism uh, this morning. <coughs> Let's pray. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your hearts, O people, lift them up to the Lord. For blessed are you, O God, the Father, creator of all things. Blessed are you, O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. You who were baptized yourself in the Jordan, crucified at Calvary, risen and glorified. Blessed are you, O Holy Spirit of God, Lord and giver of life. It's under your name and authority that we proceed here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Sarah and Dan, I'm uh, ready to ask you these questions, the questions for the baptism of your child. Do you claim God's covenant promises on Charlie's behalf and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation as you do for your own? Do you? Yes. Do you now unreservedly promise in humble reliance upon God's grace to set before Charlie an example of the new life in Christ? Do you? Yes. Do you promise to pray with and for him and bring him up in the knowledge and love of God? Do you? Now these questions are, you, are for you, the congregation of God's people. Uh, the session has authorized this baptism in your presence and for your help. So listen to these questions that we have for you. Do you, the covenant partners of this congregation, in the name of the whole Church of Christ, undertake with these parents the Christian nurture of this child, so that in due time, he may confess faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Do you? Yes. yes. Will you endeavor by your example and fellowship to strengthen the ties of this family with the household of God? Will you? We will. Amen to that. Amen. Let's pray.
Blessed be God, our Father, the Creator. Blessed be God, the Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Blessed be God, the Spirit, and the Lord and Giver of life. Grant to us, eternal God, the living presence of the risen Christ within this sacrament. Bless this water and fulfill your promise given on the day of Pentecost that this promise is for believers and their children that the Holy Spirit would descend upon us and make us ready for your kingdom. Lord, this child, being born again of water and the Holy Spirit, may be part of that new creation, united forever with Christ as a member of the church, his body, the church of Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, if you'll come to the end. You can come back and stand. I, I'm right handed, so you better come and stand with me. Okay. Ah. I'm ready. <laughs> Questions? What is the given name of this child? Charles Edward Mallory. Charles Edward Mallory. Let's see, I'm going to get the head. <laughs> Charles Edward Mallory, I baptize you in the name of the Father. In the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Lord, we pray most earnestly that we, what we have represented here, what we have used this sign to represent, that you will be actually present here to us and for us, and especially for Charlie as he grows. Lord, let us remember this moment and do all that we can to make Charlie's journey in the people of God a useful one, a welcome one, a wonderful one. Lord, we thank you so much for this little baby. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Now, folks, you should never forget the pledge that you have made. And it's easy to sit here, it's easy to sit here and to say, oh, I will or I do, right? <coughs> but there's hard work ahead. There's hard work ahead. You have pledged yourself to be my parents. Charlie. I've had a wonderful uh, and long success with babies like Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just one more. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Mm. Let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you for this baby. Watch out for him his entire life. Look over him and grant his parents the grace to fulfill what they have pledged today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Now, besides that uh, absolutely wonderful blessing, do you have other uh, joys and concerns that you would like to uh, share with each other as we go forward with our service now? Linda? This is kind of impromptu, but I would like to work to Sarah to tell the congregation Generations of God's people in that gown. Wow. Someone else? I've got a couple of items uh, here. Um, we do have uh, some poinsettias, but if you'd like to place one uh, in memory or honor of someone for uh, Christmas, and uh, the note that I have says, please contact Evelyn Ayers and uh, this week is underlined. So there must be some urgency in this. So uh, this week will be a good week to think about poinsettias for Christmas. And we did receive a wonderful um, note from Katie Ruffin Smith. And some of you will recognize that's the lady that we have been praying for, and she's been very sick. She's been very sick, but she sent a wonderful note um, to the congregation that she appreciated all the, the cards and letters and the prayers that she had received uh, from folks at Oxford. She's not uh, back to normal by any means. Uh, she's going to have a CT scan on November the 30th. Okay. And then she's going to have further surgery on December the 4th. And they're going to remove one uh, stent from the duct that goes to her pancreas. Linda, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, and then they're going to put in a different stent another, in another uh, duct that comes from the pancreas. She's been having trouble getting the pancreas to mix in with her normal digestive system, I guess. And she hasn't, uh, she hasn't had any food by mouth for 19 days. She's had a feeding tube, but she hasn't had any food by mouth for 19 days because they're trying to get this adjusted. But she was uh, upbeat in the note that she sent so we appreciate uh, your prayers and whatever you can do um, you know, to help that situation. Are there others that you'd like to mention before we, before we go on? Yeah, Rufus? I know it's been in the bulletin many times and it's been in the newspaper, but Oxford uh, Palmer Community Center will be celebrating their Christmas dinner next Sunday, starting at 5 o'clock. Ham and turkey will be furnished. And we ask that you please come out and help support Palmer. The building has been painted from top to bottom outside. And it really looks nice. What, time, what time is that room? Starts at 5 o'clock. Okay. 
Okay, 5 o'clock next Sunday then at the community center. Amen. Other, other things today? If not, uh, let's, uh, let's take up the offering this morning. Uh, bring your offerings and tithes to the Lord. Now, because of the baptism today, uh, I selected a passage of scripture which applies directly to that. It's found uh, both in Luke, at Luke 18, 15 through 17, and it's also found in the Gospel of Matthew at, in chapter 19. It's very much the same uh, passage. There is one uh, difference that has some significance uh, to it. Uh, in uh, verse 15, I'll read it in a minute, but in verse 15 in your book in there, it says, now they were bringing even infants to him. And um, in Matthew, it uses a different word uh, that is small children or something like that. But um, it strikes me that the Gospel of Luke, written by a doctor of that day and time, he uses the more specific word of infant to signify that it wasn't just young children. It was really babies like Charlie that people were bringing uh, to Jesus. So this is the good news today. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter him. Lord, 
Help us to understand this reading from your word. Seal it to our hearts, Lord, this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's fairly universal that when we hear a story or read a story or maybe see one on television or something like that, that um, we kind of gravitate toward identifying with one of the groups or characters that is represented in the story. Um, you know, I used to, uh, many years ago, uh, I used to be uh, a naval attorney. Uh, I had three year active duty, um, three years of active duty in the, the Navy. And uh, can you guess what character I uh, identified with in the TV series, JAG, mm -hmm. right? David James Elliott, you know, he was, Harmon Rab, and uh, somebody asked me one time, said, you know, is that really, is that really, uh, you know, is that, is that the way it's, the way it goes? Is that the real life, you know, like Harmon Rab and that Jack? I said, friends, it's loosely based on my career. <laughs> <laughs> Except I've never shot off a gun in the courtroom because you would be court-martialed if you did that yourself. But you know what I mean, that we, we kind of do identify with one character or another, another character. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at each of the groups in this story, and Jesus as well, to see what we can learn on the broader scale of what this passage is saying to us. So let's, let's start with the parents. Uh, and you know, we have our parents here presenting, have presented Charlie for baptism. So what this passage is saying is that the parents were doing the right thing in introducing, introducing their children to Jesus. You know, the, the parents were responsible. It's, it's something that the children might not have known what to do, but the parents were responsible for bringing their children to Jesus, putting them in touch with Jesus, letting them see what Jesus had been doing and how he would respond to them as children. Now, that can be translated easily into our modern situation. These parents, okay, Dan and, Dan and Sarah, they have the responsibility to introduce Charlie to Jesus, to bring Charlie into close connection with Jesus. And you know, uh, it's, not, it's not that hard to do. Think, think about how it, it goes in other parts of our lives. You know, if... Uh, if a dad or a mom is a big uh, sports fan, they don't have any problem getting their uh, children balls to play with, bats to play with, uh, maybe books uh, to read. Um, you know, I, I have to uh, I have to confess here. Um, our son uh, Matt, uh, Sharon, and my son Matt, our firstborn son, was born in 1975. And we were living in Key West, Florida at the time. That's when I was in the Navy, stationed at the air station there. And uh, at that, that one year, Key West had a minor league baseball team. So Matt was born on the 19th of May. And by the middle of June, he was already going to Key West Cubs baseball game. You know, it just seemed natural. We're going to the game. We'll take the baby along. There, there he was. You know, and that, that's the kind of natural attachment that parents need to have and others need to have to bring children in 
close contact with Jesus. You know, what? how can you do that at home? Bible story books? Right? Those, those ones that have, you know, wonderful pictures, you know? Read a Bible story every night. Uh, how about how about prayer? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Yeah. Or singing, singing prayer. My wife's uh, a fan of singing blessings at mealtime. Be present at our table. I won't sing it. Be present at our table, Lord. Be here and everywhere adored. These mercies bless and grant that we may feast in paradise with thee. Just a little something to indicate the affinity that you as parents have for prayer. And you know, not too, uh, not too early to start our Father who art in heaven. You know, you might not get the whole thing in one sitting, right? But that's not the way kids learn anyhow. You know, you can just get a little bit at a time. So I, I invite you parents to, to think of those things. How about the children in this story? How about the children? You know, it's a great position to be in in relationship to Jesus, the children in the story. Because what does Jesus say? Let the children come to me. Jesus is not making it hard. He's making it easy for the children to come to, to Jesus. Jesus is, is opening up himself. In fact, when the disciples tried to prevent him from coming, Jesus said, no, don't hinder them. And in Luke's version, this is, this is pretty amazing. In Luke's version, the scripture says that Jesus said, unless you become as a little child, he's speaking to the adults now, unless you become as a little child, you may not enter the kingdom. That, that should get you thinking. I mean, seriously, that's, that's a, a, an idea that you can really spend some useful time thinking about. What is it what is it that children have that many adults don't have? You see, that's what, that's what Jesus is saying, that Jesus says, you need to come as a little child. Well, I may not, we may not get everything, but the first thing I would, I would mention is that children are very trusting. You know, uh, and I, I appreciate Anne and Sarah, your care of Charlie, because when I picked him up, he was fine. He felt that same trust with me that he does with you all. So you've taught him something already about what it means to trust, trust people. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Unless you trust Jesus, unless you trust God, unless you believe what the scriptures have to say about who God is and what God is like, it's definitely hard to draw close to Him. You have to have that trust. You know, I saw, I saw a vivid image of this once years ago. Uh, I was at a uh, community swimming pool and there was a little uh, little girl about, oh, I'd say she was about four, four years old, something like that. And so I noticed that she was jumping into the deep end of the pool. So she was jumping into a, a, a section of the pool that was about 10 feet deep when she was only about three feet high. And I thought, so what, what causes her to do that? And then I saw the answer. Her dad was in the pool 
with open arms waiting for her to jump. She couldn't wait to get out of that pool so she could jump in because she utterly, steadfastly trusted in her dad to catch her when she jumped into the pool. That's the kind of trust that we need to have in Jesus. Now, there's parts of our world that don't really help us to trust. Okay? There's parts of our world that, you know, want to make us afraid, they want to make us doubting. But Jesus is saying, at some point we need to be like a child and trust Him and His Word. And in a sense, jump into the pool and be caught in His arms. Oh, if we can just do that, if we can have that kind of trust, then we can come to Jesus and we can bring our children slowly along with that kind of, of trust that we have. Because, because children are more naturally trusting or should be more naturally trusting. You know, another thing about children is they're great at receiving gifts. Did you have any trouble, like, at Christmas time giving gifts to your children? No, they're ready for gifts. They, they want gifts, right? They, probably they're making a list now for you if they're getting a little, little older. But, you know, sometimes adults have problems with thinking about receiving a gift, even if the gift is from Jesus. But that's another thing that we can learn from children is to have that kind of joy joy in the gifts that Jesus is giving to us. We don't have to merit, we don't have to achieve always. No. Just to receive the gift of Christ. What about the disciples? That's the third group, right? And they're the ones that, eh, they sort of got a bad reputation. Because Jesus does rebuke them and say, don't hinder the children coming, from me, uh, coming to me. You know, I'd like to redeem them a little bit. You know, those apostles that were closest to Jesus, they knew at some level how important Jesus' ministry was, right? And they knew that there were crowds that pressed in on Jesus at different times, and he couldn't even kind of move around or get to the place he needed to get to or perform his ministry maybe in the way they thought he should. So maybe there was a good motive behind their saying, no, this, this, you know, you can't bother him that much because he's got something really more important. But Jesus said, no, there's nothing more important. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such as these belong. But maybe, maybe they also had a little bit of, oh, um, this is a grown-up thing. You know, we're, we're following Jesus because we know what's going on, and, you know, that's, that message is for grown-ups. And if you grow up, then it will be for you, but not now. No, that's not right. That's not right. No. Jesus' message is for the children. Do not hinder them. How, how do we hinder children from coming to Jesus? Okay, how do we hinder you? Have you thought of that? Sometimes with our words, the way we speak about faith, the way we speak about church, the way we speak about Jesus. <clears throat> you know, there's... There's a kind of irony that some people use Jesus' name in vain as a curse. Wow. 
You know, once that comes out of your mouth, you can't really take it back. And what if, what if children hear that? <coughs> you know, it, it just really, or, or even maybe not that direct, maybe, maybe uh, the way you speak to others, other than just cursing. Your words can definitely have an impact on children. Or what about your attitude? You know, your attitude about church, your attitude about teaching the Bible stories to your children, your actions. You know, some of us uh, make a good profession of faith, but we don't always follow up. Okay, so we have to be careful as adults that we're not hindering our children or even hindering other adults from coming to Jesus. You know, I, once in a while, um, once in a while when I was an active pastor out in Bath County, that there were a few things that I decided that I might have liked to do, that there wasn't anything really wrong about them to do, but maybe I refrained from those actions just because I didn't want the people in Bath County to misunderstand the message that I was trying to get across. So you really do have to watch your actions. Your actions, your words, your attitudes. Don't be like those disciples. No, invite people to come to Jesus. Open the way for them to come. Invite them to church or Sunday school or Bible study or, or to come pray with them. Those are the things that attract people. Finally, we do come to Jesus. He took the children in his arms and blessed them. He placed his hands on them. You know, it's not it's not by accident that I took Charlie in my arms this morning. That was intentional. I was representing this congregation. I was representing this congregation taking, taking Charlie up in my arms saying that this congregation is open open to that little one and ready to take responsibility and to support these parents in their ministry with their, their children. You know, I had, a, uh, I had a wonderful pastor back years ago when I was, he came to our church in 1962 when I was about 13 years old. And he was, uh, he stayed for 10 years until he retired. And he was like a grandfather to me. You know, my grandfathers had died uh, fairly, well, not, not too early in life, but they were, had been gone for some time, by 1962. And, uh, and that pastor just opened, opened the way for me to see what God is really like. My parents did as well, but that was, you know, another person, a different person who shows the way to come <coughs> to Jesus. Mm, I appreciated him so much. And I ended up uh, being influenced by him eventually. Uh, that was part of my call to become a pastor. That was after I got finished David James Elliott, you know, the gun and everything. <coughs> and that's how I came to Oxford. Came to Oxford just about a year ago because the people here were very welcoming to me.
to come and to share Jesus with them and for me to see Jesus working in and through them as we have seen today. Let us pray. We do thank you, Lord, for the many ways that you call us to come and to be with you. The blessing that you give us when we do. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. <coughs> In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, we're going to sing uh, the children's hymn. It's on the back of your bulletin. Jesus loves me this I know. today, thinking of how you can bring someone to Jesus. Open the path, whether it's children or adults, for those to come close and find their place with Jesus. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of God's Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.